haven't seen it all, all week. There you are. Good. Uh, Mark is here then. Ryan and Mark talking about creating citable data identifiers. Okay, um, so first of all, thank you. I cannot believe that this many people stuck around on their valuable afternoon to hear about identifiers. That's really impressive. Um, you know, I don't know that I'm even that enthusiastic about <laughs> identifiers. Um, <laughs> so instead, I want to tell you a little something about what happened to me on Saturday. On Saturday, I was far away from here. It was about 35 degrees hotter than it is here. <laughs> I was sweating profusely. Um, and I was at this little, uh, little rental house on the beach called the Mimosa House. Um, so the Mimosa House is located at 807 South Virginia Dare Trail in Kill Devil Hills, North Carolina, USA. <clears throat> 27948. Now, Kill Devil Hills is um, not really very well known internationally, but it should be. It, it has its own little claim to fame. It was the site of this event, uh, the first powered flight um, by Wilbur and Orville Wright at approximately uh, 1903, 1217, 36.019705 degrees north, 75.668769 degrees west. But I digress. So it was hot. I was packing up my belongings to head to the airport and, and rush over here to you all. Um, and then this little part caused me some trouble. Um, so this is a uh, transistor assembly for my van, uh, 79330S84A41. Um, and it happens to uh, control the air conditioner. Um, so I had a four hour drive without air conditioning, rushing to the airport. Um, I had to stop to take a shower before I could go to the airport. Uh, by the way, my, my van um, ha has this VIN number. Well, not exactly this one. This one happens to belong to a Porsche. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I digress. Um, as I was fiddling with the controls, trying to get some cooling out of the air conditioner, I switched the vents to one of the settings that I don't normally use in the, center, uh, in the summer, and out of the lower vents blew this little guy. Oh, uh, Octus skeletus reclusa, uh, the brown, reclu brown recluse spider, uh, very poisonous. Um, luckily, I, I managed to get him before he got me, and, and so I'm not writhing in pain and, and taking antibiotics this week. Oh, hooray. But this whole sequence of events led me to think that, you know, we use a real range of identifiers in our everyday life when we're just citing things that happen to us. Um, some of those identifiers are really oriented towards human use and common names. And some of them, like the, the VIN number at the bottom there, are much more machine oriented and, and not very friendly for humans. Um, so we really have to take care as we're putting identifiers in our systems and designing identifier schemes to make sure that the identifiers can be easily used. Um, you know, standing up here trying to read you longitude and latitude numbers is not all that easy, right? You know, I wish those identifiers were a little more human friendly. Um, but they were built for a very specific purpose. They weren't really built for humans to stand up here and, and cite things. Um, so the focus of my talk here is on data identifiers. And when you have a repository that <coughs> contains data and you really want that data to be cited by people and reused, we want to make those identifiers in a way that's friendly for humans to use. So let's look at some examples of, of how repositories use identifiers nowadays. Here's an object in an ePrints repository. Um, it has an identifier here. Um, 
it's not too bad. Humans can handle it. Um, and humans can, in fact, handle this more globally unique URL that contains the identifier. <coughs> Fine so far. Um, here's an object in a Fedora repository. Now, Fedora doesn't really impose an identifier scheme on people. It has an internal scheme, but no one uses that. Um, so in this, in this object, um, there is an accession number. But when you're actually looking at, at the web page for this object, it doesn't really make the full globally unique identifier prominent. Um, so you have to dig around in the URL a little bit, and, and then you see this identifier that's at the bottom. Now, it's a much longer identifier. It's not really something that I want to sit up here and, and read to you all, or if I'm you know, reading an article and I want to type it in, um, that's not very human friendly. Um, so obviously, this system wasn't designed with human citation use in mind. And I'll admit, I had something to do with assigning these identifiers. So that's my fault. Um, here's an object in a DSpace repository. Um, DSpace does really impose an identifier scheme on you. Um, but it also takes some pains to make the identifiers somewhat usable. So the identifiers are right up front. Um, they're fairly short and fairly easy to understand for people who use repositories. Um, for an average scientist coming to this page, they say, why should I cite that URL? Why can't I cite the URL that's in my address bar? You know, I don't understand. What is this handle thing? Um, so if we look to a source that scientists do understand, if we look to nature, um, well, of course, everyone knows, well, nature is a journal. Journals use DOIs, OK? And when a scientist comes to a DOI, they, they have an idea of what's going on. They say, aha, I know how to resolve this. I know that I should use it in the citation for my paper. So why don't repositories do this? Uh, so here's where I'm going to get a little controversial. I, I'm going to present what I think are some good principles for designing identifiers. I, I'm not going to dare to call these best practices because I'm sure that 90% of you will have a problem with at least one of my principles, if not all of them. Um, but I think you should follow them and try to use them as much as you can in the future. Number one, use DOIs. Um, DOIs are very familiar to scientists. They're becoming familiar to people who are not scientists. Um, scientists don't understand a handle. They don't understand a pearl. They don't understand an info URI. Um, just use a DOI. Um, when you use a DOI, you, you get a certain amount of weight accorded to you, your citation. People think, aha, this is a DOI. It's someone took care to assign a DOI to it. It's important. Um, and you get a big bonus that lots and lots of services and tools are compatible with DOIs, understand how to work with DOIs. So in repositories, eh, repositories don't, or at least the repository platforms that are commonly represented at this conference, don't really provide a lot of support for DOIs. Need some work. Principle number two, keep your identifiers simple. Um, so here is an example of the type of DOI that we use in the Dryad repository. Um, we try to keep them as short and simple as possible. We do take um, the liberty of adding our own little branding in here so that users can tell when they see the DOI in print. They can tell <coughs> something about what that object is, uh, where that identifier resolves. Um, but otherwise, uh, we try to keep the, uh, the more unique part of the identifier as short and sweet as possible using a combination of, of alphabetic and numeric characters. Um, <coughs> no matter how much you intend your identifiers to only be used within the system and only be used by machines, so you might be tempted to add long strings of digits and checksums and whatnot, um, there are always cases where humans will end up manually working with these identifiers, whether they see it on a slide and they're trying to write it down. Um, so I'll challenge some of you to actually 
resolve these two actual DOIs at the bottom. Um, I don't know how long it will take you to type those in and, and actually find out what they are, um, but I'm not going to give you much of a chance either. Um. <laughs> okay, so do repositories support really simple identifiers? Well, of course they do. You just need some good policies to back up the fact that these identifiers are simple. Um, repositories also support long and nasty identifiers. Uh, don't do it. Principle number three. Go ahead and, and add some syntax into your identifiers that represents semantic relationships. Um, now I know this is where I get into the really deep water because conventional wisdom is do not put any semantics into your identifier. It will break at some point in the future. Well, yes, it likely will. But if you can provide some hints in your identifier that users know might not exactly work at some point in the future, but you take care to make sure that you assign your identifiers in a way that these things are likely to retain their relationships as long as possible. Uh, it's just a huge benefit to everyone. Um, so in Dryad, we put um, subparts onto the end of our identifier with a slash, uh, which is a fairly commonly <laughs> accepted usage. Um, for slashes um, out in the HTTP world, uh, but it's not so common in identifiers. Uh, so if I add this slash three onto the end, then usually someone will pick up on the fact that, oh, if I'm looking at this object with a slash three, I can manually pull off that slash three and I can get the higher level object and I can work with it. Uh, and that's really nice. Um, <coughs> there are some examples here of ePrints identifiers and there are relationships between these three identifiers, but you know, ePrints doesn't really provide this kind of functionality, so you can't just look at the identifiers and notice any relationships happening. Uh, in fact, the first two identifiers there are different versions of the ePrint software, and the third identifier is a plug-in module for ePrints. Uh, note there about statistics. Um, if you have this kind of structure in your identifier, you can also <coughs> more easily track statistics about how your content is used. So if, if I want to know, you know how much any of these items uh, with the dryad.123ab are being used, I can aggregate the counts for that with the ones that have a slash something on the end. Um, and it just makes it a little bit easier to handle. Um, again, it might break if I make some changes to the structure of my objects in the future, but I'm unlikely to do that. And so I'm, I'm willing to sacrifice the might for a lot of ease of use today. Mm -hmm. And again, current repository platforms don't provide a lot of support for this. Um, need some work. Okay. More specific to scientists. Uh, we had a lot of discussion when we were developing our repository on how we should change identifiers when the underlying content changes. And scientists are pretty picky about this as a whole. Um, sometimes they have differing opinions, but usually what it comes down to is there are certain parts of a digital object that have meaning for the audience and certain parts that they don't care so much about. Uh, so for a typical scientific object, you may have an Excel file. And that Excel file contains a lot of numbers. And the scientists don't want those numbers to ever change. They don't want a single bit of that Excel file to change without having the identifier change. So we have to be pretty careful in our repository about making sure that each identifier uniquely identifies a completely invariant bit stream. Um, this supports things like machine repeatable workflows um, to revalidate results of research. Of course, this gets tricky when you want to add more functionality in your repository. If you add something like a slash thumbnail on the end, then later on when you change the meaning of your thumbnail generation process, you perhaps change the resolution of your thumbnail images, then 
the items identified by that type of identifier won't be the same bits anymore. They'll be the same as far as a human viewing them, but they won't be exactly the same machine verifiable. Uh, this kind of process seems intuitive to repository managers, um, but it actually flies kind of in the face of the DOI system and, and the conventions that have built up around DOIs. Um, so normally when you have a DOI for a journal article, that DOI resolves to an HTML landing page. And the content on that landing page can change every day. You know, it may contain a feed of blog entries, it may contain relationships to other articles. Um, that page may change dramatically if the journal gets moved to a different publisher. Um, in that case, what the scientist cares about as being invariant or the meaning bearing content is the actual text of the article itself. So they don't care about whether that web page changes. Um, so contrast that with the meaningless content. Um, usually in a repository, um, there is a certain amount of content that the scientist doesn't care quite so much about being invariant. Um, a lot of times, at least in our repository, that ends up being descriptive metadata. So you have someone go in and correct a typo in an author's name, or someone goes and adds an extra subject keyword. Those kinds of changes shouldn't change the identifier that's assigned to an object. Because when humans are citing this object, you really want to cite that concept, the, the invariant bits. You don't care about some of these descriptive changes. Oh. OK, so how do repository systems support the, these versioning related requirements? Well, not so well, again. Uh, so ePrints supports fairly rich versioning, but again, it doesn't have those kind of semantic additions to the identifiers syntax that we really would like to support human use. Uh, DSpace, as currently released, doesn't support versioning at all. Uh, Fedora has really good low-level versioning of every single change that happens to an object. Um, but this ends up being really too granular for citation purposes. You don't want every single character change in descriptive metadata to force you to use a new identifier. So, of course, in order to build a repository that has all of these features, we had to invest a little bit of work. Uh, so for various reasons, aside from identifiers, we had already been using DSpace when we realized that our identifiers needed to follow these principles. And so we had to do some work on it. Uh, so I'm going to run quickly through some of the technical details here. Um, if you're interested in the deeper technical details, Mark Degree will go into a bit more uh, during one of the DSpace sessions later this week. Um, but what we did was add a new identifier service into our DSpace instance, uh, which allows a separate set of identifiers other than the DSpace handles. Um, it's fairly agnostic. It, it allows us to use DOIs, but it also allows for easy extension when new identifier systems become popular in the future. Uh, it allows us really granular control of when an identifier is generated and when it is actually registered with an external service. And it provides some services for generating citations and sending those citations off to external services. Uh, so again, I won't go into great detail here, but the identifier service <coughs> comes into play when a new submission is created in DSpace. That identifier service um, goes out to our provider of choice, uh, which is the EasyID service run by the California Digital Library, uh, which provides our DOIs. Um, and then they push those out to the data site system. Once all of our information is migrated to the data site system, then we get advantage. Uh, we get to take advantage of all these magic DOI services. Um, so data site 
um, even though it's still pretty young, provides some nice services in their um, content service here. They let people look up DOIs. They provide information in various formats, um, very linked data compliant. Um, you can read relationships between the identifiers, um, not just the relationships that we've embedded into the syntax of the identifier, but the relationships that are stored in the metadata. Um, you can export that kind of um, all the metadata in various formats, either for textual citation purposes or for more machine processing purposes. And then we added some features into our own DSpace installation just to make those citations really upfront and, and in your face. So whenever you load a page in Dryad, you'll actually see at the top of the page, here's how to cite this item, um, because we really want to promote citation. So a few words about versioning. Um, I explained this kind of complicated versioning set of requirements that we have where certain things change identifiers and certain things don't change identifiers. Um, and we decided the best way to do that is to really make it under control of the user. Um, so new versions are created by pushing a button. Um, <coughs> And what that means in terms of Dryad is that when you push a button, a new object is created, and that object uh, is returned to the submission system. It goes through the normal submission process just like an original object would, but it's a copy of the original. Um, and the diagram there shows that it's basically the same process. You just create a new version, and the item gets returned to the submission process which goes through all the normal DOI registration. Within the system, these are normal items as they would normally appear in a DSpace system, but there's a layer of versioning added on top of them. Um, there are some lower level connections as well, allowing new versions of items <coughs> to use the uh, bitstream storage more effectively so that when I create a new version of an item and I only change one file, then the hundred other files can just be referenced rather than being copied on the server. And so the result is that we have these identifiers with versioning as you would expect. And uh, you'll notice the semantics here. Uh, we've added just a dot and a version number into the identifier. Um, so it's possible if you're dealing with an item that has a version and subparts, then you'll have dots and slashes mixed in the identifier. OK, so in the future, uh, we're planning to do a little bit more work on the versioning system at some point. Um, as I said, we're not really making new versions for random metadata changes, but we do want to track those so that we can understand the history of an object's editing. Um, so we need to think about how to track all this information in the background without explicitly assigning a new forefront visible identifier to it. Um, we're starting to work um, to integrate these changes into DSpace. Hopefully, um, a lot of the versioning components will go into DSpace 3.0 at the end of this year. Um, but we want to really make sure that we discuss it with the rest of the DSpace community so that what gets committed into the central system works for everyone. OK, so we've determined all these requirements. We've done a lot of work to make changes in DSpace so that people can use and cite these identifiers. How well has it worked? Um, it's OK. You know, it, it takes some time. You know, there's a lot of community change that needs to go on before people get really comfortable citing data identifiers. Oh. So last year, we took a sample of some content from Dryad, and, and we manually went through and, and looked up all the associated articles and did some analysis of how and, and where they cited the associated data in the article. Uh, so 77% of them had what I would call good citations to the data. That's a citation where either in the text of the article or in the references, they had the full DOI present. Um, they were indicating the proper object. Uh, now, 2% of them had bad citations. Um, these were people who um, 
didn't really understand DOIs, uh, surprisingly enough. Uh, and 21% of those just had no citations to the data at all. And we're still kind of working with the community to make sure that they're fully aware that when they deposit their data in an archive, it gets a real DOI and they should cite that. Uh, so here are some examples. Um, they're in two columns on, on the left are all excerpts from one article and on the right are all excerpts from another article. These are how people have been citing their data. A lot of people put their citation to the data right there in the running text of the article. Um, sometimes they'll put them in a special section at the end of the article uh, calling attention to data associated with this article or supplementary materials. And here's an example of a, a bad citation. Um, so someone here didn't, didn't know that there was a whole DOI here that had to be presented in the citation. Uh, they just called it an ac accession number. Um, uh, and this was an article in Science. Oh, sad. All right, so I've told you what I think about identifiers. Um, how many people disagree with me? Do I get a show of hands? All right. So you can all come and yell at me at, at dinner tonight. Great. <laughs> um, but really why I want you to get out of this is, is not, you know, you know, oh, these are Ryan's identifiers rules. I, I might have to follow them. Uh, what I want you to do is go back and think about your content and how it's used and how people are going to reuse it and cite it and make sure that your identifiers really support those purposes and don't just go with the identifiers that you've been given by virtue of the repository platform that you've selected. OK, so that's all. Um, before I open for questions, I, I will mention that Dryad is hiring. We just opened two positions, one for a developer and one for user interface designer. Um, so come and talk to me if you're interested in those. Thanks. Thank you very much, Ryan. Um, definitely time for some questions. Uh, two or three questions I'm sure we can fit in. And then remember that we've got our developers waiting next door to tell us what is going on. Uh, who would like to ask Ryan a question? Just want to say, by the way, I think uh, as Ryan uh, alluded, it's, uh, it's, it's been very good to hear this uh, relatively dry topic brought to life <laughs> by our three speakers. I think we've all managed to stay on the ball. So now I see there's a question, two even. So. Hi, Ryan. Uh, Rob Sanderson, Los Alamos National Labs. Um, so I definitely agree with your fourth and fifth principles. They're great. Um, the DOIs just don't seem to work with them. So <laughs> I, I buy the social engineering aspect of people are familiar with DOIs, but the technical side just seems wrong. Um, for example, um, you go to a DOI, dx.doi, and you dereference it, and you end up at different bits every time because you've got a link resolver in there. So how does that jive with your fourth principle that when you change something, even one bit, then you should get the, um, you should have a different identifier? Okay. So I, I, I perhaps oversimplified a little. Um, when you resolve one of our DOIs, you go through a link resolver, and, and you do get to an HTML landing page. Um, and that HTML landing page, as is customary with DOIs, usually contains content that people will click on and download. In our case, not articles, but data files. Okay, Those data files we guarantee to be um, static for a given identifier. So we'll never change those data files. Um, we do offer um, an extension onto our DOI. Um, it, it's not registered as a full DOI, but you can take the DOI and, and add you know, slash bitstream and, and actually get the invariant bits, and, and those will be static all the time. Uh, but, but you're right that you know we're still providing an HTML page, and that HTML page will change whenever we update the styling of our website. 
and, and I know Simeon gave some, some good reasons why certain cases can't use DOIs. Uh, but I certainly, everyone who can use DOIs, please do. I think we've got time for just one more. We've got a data librarian in the room, so I think we should let her have the last word. I was going to say it's a naive question, actually, but because um, what we're thinking about for our institutional data repository, whether to, s to switch over from handles to DOIs, but um, for example, someone said in the workshop the other day, you can't have um, you can't have a second DOI for the same object in a different location. So, for example, if we're harvesting data sets from the data archive or other um, subject repositories, maybe you don't have this issue because you are a s subject repository. But if you're if you're getting a second version, or in, I, I don't mean a second edition, but the same thing, but you just want it there because it's in your institutional repository, um, what do you do if you can't mint a new DOI for it? So. You can certainly just promote the DOI that it was originally given somewhere else. Um, but I, I'll question that statement that you can't have two DOIs for an object. Certainly, it's not clean to have many different identifiers for a given object. Um, but if you think of the identifier not as identifying just this single object, but identifying that object as represented in a particular repository, then it's always reasonable to have an identifier for each instance of that object. Okay, but this is where I, why I said it's a naive question because I got I got that impression for, from other people and from the speaker the other day who s she made it sound like it was not allowed by the DOI issuing agency. In this case, it would be data site. That is something I have not heard. Um, so our DOI agency um, has not complained. Um, I don't think we've ever run into a case yet where we've had an object like that. Um, but they at least haven't warned us about it. Uh, so sounds I think the DOI Foundation would allow what the kind of thing you're talking about on the assumption that the other DOI identifies the version of record and yours identifies as something else. Okay. I'm glad we sorted that one out. Right. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> Ryan, thank you very much again, Ryan. <laughs> and all our speakers, thank you very much. And uh, over now to the developers' uh, challenge next door in Theatre 4. I assume I should turn this off because it's. <laughs>